In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondocast. Official podcast of Lindablog.com, the home of whatever the podcast that has more reruns than TV Land. That's right. I'm your host, Stephen, and with me for this transition into this amazing rerun show. You doing an intro to a transition? This is an intro transition. It's oh. an intrusion. It's an intrusion. Is Danielle? The ever questioning of my intrusions. <laughs> Keep making up words. Um, so today's show, you get to listen to the second episode of the BTILC podcast, which I have started, the official slash unofficial Big Trouble in Little China podcast. And you also get the awesome third episode. Now the second episode is super duper special. Because I interviewed Gerald Okamura, a.k.a. the Wing Kong Golden Gunslinger. That guy who's on every poster with the bandoliers and the golden guns and the bald head and looking super awesome. He's on my podcast art. Got to sit down and talk to him over, you know, the magic of telecommunication. And I also got to sit down in my third episode and talk to Charlie of the Girlfriend Movies. And uh, that was super fun to listen to how he puts his podcast together with his girlfriend. It was very enlightening to see that, you know, we're not that different, you know. We all just do podcasts with our girlfriends. So that's the way the world works. Um, If you enjoy the show, please uh, subscribe to the BTILC podcast. You can just uh, go to BTILC.com for more information. And you could also follow us on Twitter at BTILC Podcast. As well, you should also follow at Vundablog and at Vundacast. And uh, make sure that you're subscribed to the Vundacast on Stitcher and iTunes. So many things. There's a lot of things to do. I didn't haven't even mentioned Facebook. You can like like, the BTILC Podcast on Facebook. Like you know, like a kind of like a wolf thing. I've been rewatching The Office. I remember Ryan's horrible idea, Wolf. What's Wolf? A Wolf was like you sent a notification, and it notified. It like basically was everywhere. So it was like it was all all your things in one. Oh. So it would send you. I mean, I guess we do kind of have that yeah, now. On Instagram, you can have notif- sort of. No, because you can have notifications on your phone and stuff with all your different apps. But I just still feel like there should be like one app to rule them all that has all the apps together. Well, that would be the thing. I guess, but I guess that they wouldn't like that because then they wouldn't be competing, and I've defeated the purpose of the free market. So, oh well. Fuck you fuck commie your, scum. Fucking free markets. <laughs> the Russians believe in the idea of the one market, the one app. So we're gonna talk about Big Trouble in Little China today on this episode, and I also have to take a digression to say that I saw Big Trouble in Little China. Whoa. On 35mm, as God intended, in a theater as full God of intended. people at 11.30 at night in Coral Gables in Florida. It's and part of Florida. Whoa. It was super exciting. The film was alive. Granted, there was alcohol flowing abundantly, but it was a transcendent experience. People had gone there, had never seen the movie, and left just loving the movie. I was quoting along and having a blast. 
and uh, it was amazing. So, big ups to Coral Gables Art Cinema. You guys are awesome. Uh, so, and now, me talking to people for the rest of the episode. Enjoy. This is Steven Escudero in the old Podcast Express, and I'm talking to whoever's listening. This is the BTILC Podcast, the audio show dedicated to the motion picture known as Big Trouble in Little China. I am joined on this second edition of the BTILC by the Wing Kong Golden Gunman himself, the martial arts legend, Gerald Okamura. Thank you for joining us, Gerald. Are you ready to hit some bullet points with me? Absolutely. Thank you for calling, Stephen. What do you do it. What do you consider your first big break in cinema, and how did it come about? Uh, let's see. The first time that uh, anything to do with the movie industry was uh, back in, I guess, 75 or 76 when I did uh, the Kung Fu series with Carradine. I had a part in there, uh, and the way it came about was... Uh, my instructor got called for a part as a Shaolin uh, a priest, and he didn't want to go, so uh, he sent me. Not knowing the industry, uh, uh, I went, and I lucked out by having the, the technical advisor by the name of David Chow. He was a technical advisor there. He knew about me, so he let me stay and then do the one-day gig. That's how everything got started. So from one day, you parlayed that one day into a whole career. That's amazing. <laughs> well, uh, that was the first TV, and, and you know, how things go. You kind of, I'm kind of satisfied with one big deal on TV. And the next year, uh, uh, I had a chance to do a, a movie, which was even a, a bigger thrill. Uh, by the name of uh, Killer Elite, and they had like James Caan and um, Sil- Sterling Silicon wrote it and that kind of deal. But again, that that's another story. There, my weapons kind of took me to an audition, and uh, I got picked as one of the fighters. So that's kind of how everything started: TV and movie. That's amazing. Um, how did you get into weapon crafting? Was that something you just uh, were always interested in? Yeah, kind of. The thing is, uh, the ninjutsu art is very intriguing, and that kind of was my, my, my interest. You know, small secret things that you could carry around. Uh, and so I started coming up with some of my own ideas on on how to uh, get around some of the, you know. So, uh, yeah, the weapon stuff just kind of came about. And then, uh, as you know, once you get a weapon, you, you, you got to kind of know how to use it. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the Kung Fu that I have is uh, Kung Fu Sun Tzu. I think the biggest thing that I got out of the art is that it's very flexible. Uh, you know, if you know, if you just have a pen, if you know the the basic fundamental usage of the pen as a weapon, you know, you can put it to any any. Uh, the art gave me the the flexibility to to kind of use whatever I had in my hand as a weapon. So, yeah, that's kind of that's pretty uh, scary and exciting at the same time. That's pretty cool. Um. 
Do you have a uh, a favorite uh, movie or like movie genre that you're interested in, that you watch as a fan? Are you? Uh... Well, as a, as a fan, uh, my thing goes back into the old samurai days. Uh, movie, the samurai movie, uh, like Zatoichi, uh, uh You know, they they, they have the sleepy eye, uh, one arm, one eye. You know, the blind. Uh, yeah, Ku- Ku- Kurosawa kind of films. Deal. Stuff like that. Corso, yeah. Now that's that's different. That's classic, right? Yeah, that's yeah. Very classic. His stuff is so classic. If you don't understand the way he shoots it, you can't appreciate his type of uh, filming. Uh, so I, I kind of put that kind of in a different class. Uh, things that I like to watch, like I said, is Zatoichi, a lot of action. Uh, and uh, Lone Wolf and the Baby Carriage uh, episodes, you know. Cool. Yeah. Um, Big Trouble in Little China is your 12th acting credit, according to IMDb. Do you remember getting the job? Was that a similar, uh, you know, someone was supposed to show up and you made it and, and that was the story? Or Well, the way it goes is that I heard about an open call. They were looking for martial arts stunt people. So what I did was, at, uh, in fact, they had it at 20th Century Fox, one of the studios uh, that is set up for an audition. And John Carpenter was there. So what I did was I, I loaded up a lot of my weapons. I took one of my students to help me out with my demo. Uh, uh, I couldn't get him in as a stunt player, but he helped me get my job there. And uh, the funny part is that uh, I auditioned I, uh, for Carpenter. I gave uh, some extra uh, demos on some of the weapons that I created strictly for for movie kind of effect, not so much weapons uh, in itself. Uh, and uh, I finished the audition, went home. Two days later, I get a call from... Uh, one of the guys that was helping out uh, pick, pick some fighters, and he says, hey, we want to use you uh, uh, tomorrow uh, report to a uh, prop shop at 20th Century Fox. So I get there thinking that I'm going to be uh, using a lot of uh, martial arts weapons, and the guy hands me two gold-plated pistols. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and I the guy says, here, this is going to be the weapons for, for your character. Uh, and kind of jump ahead since I'm on the roll here, uh, you know, going through some of your questions. Uh, it was, I know for a fact that the writer didn't create this character. Uh, okay. John Carpenter should be the guy to take all the credit for creating this character. When I got there, they said, John wants to put these two gold-plated pistols on you. And then he says, uh, John also wants to put some bandoleros on you, but they wanted the bullets to be, uh, you know, like an elephant gun type bullet that never fit, fits in a six-shooter. And, you know, okay, that's fine with me. And so, uh, like I said, uh, I got to give John Carpenter you know, for creating this character for me, man. Yeah. John, Super. John Carpenter put together the look, but you, you certainly gave it the soul and the style that made it jump off the screen and makes it still last now, 29 years later. Um, uh, you're so kind to say it, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, like I said, I've gotten a lot of feedback in all these years to this day. Uh, so, yes, uh, it's a character uh, that, you know, I, I'm not going to forget. The public hasn't forgotten. Uh, they show Big Trouble just about every month on cable network. So it's it's really running like crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, people love it. W- w- yeah. Did when, uh, when you were working on the set, w- did you commute to set? Like, did you drive in or did you did you stay at a hotel nearby? How did, do you remember how they put you guys no, no. up? No, no, no. This was all uh, what what they consider locals. Okay. It wasn't like uh, 
So yeah, I was driving in every day, and and a, a story to that because they were picking up a lot of martial art, martial artists, back strong people. I had some people that I knew that got picked uh, to work the project as background. And background people had to park outside the lot. I, w- I was one of the privileged that ha- could drive into the lot. <laughs> so what I would do is I'd, I'd pick up these guys, three guys, and then they'd jump in my car and we drive in, you know, like some big shot. <laughs> That's so you a had kind a funny story, you know. But yeah. You had yeah. a full entourage so was, on entry. <laughs> yeah. Um, was it a was it a fun set? Did it feel spontaneous? Does John Carpenter, in your experience, keep a you know a lighthearted set, or did it yeah, feel like work? It, you know, it, yeah, it, it it was one of the better sets that uh, I've been working on, uh, have been working on, uh, uh, because of all the the people that I knew, the, the martial arts people, the martial arts world. Um, and, and actually, uh, Kirk is Kirk Russell, Mr. Russell is, is such a nice person. He can get along with anybody, you know. And again, uh, because of my character, I, I wanted to participate more. But every time I get picked, they want they want like ten stunt guys. I'd go, and then John would say, "No, you're too recognizable for this for this scene. So go back, hang out, drink drink some coffee or whatever, you know." But that was pretty cool. So he kind of looked after the character. He was he was right that you were too recognizable because you really do steal like the first third of the film. You, you you're you're honestly one of my favorite moments in the movie. So the talking oh, to you is you just such much. a great honor. Um, wh- what was your or is your favorite acting job so far? in your legendary career and feel no pressure to say Big Trouble in Little China as the answer right well it's different different classes right like Big Trouble is, is very iconic that that it's still alive my character is still alive but I've had some other uh, smaller movie projects that uh, not favorite but uh, just a little bit more to it, you know, a uh, little bit more uh, acting than just stunts. Uh, but um, when you come right down to it, uh, Big Trouble would be right up there. Big Trouble Little China would be right up there with a lot of the, um, my favorites, you know. Um, they're, they're working on a Big Trouble in Little China remake right now. I don't know if you've heard with uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, supposedly to star if they if they contacted you for a, a cameo or something would you be interested in reprising or or showing them a little uh, a little love no I, I figured that you know I'm I would be disappointed if uh, The Rock played Jack Burton I, I hope Jack Burton is Jack Burton that's Kirk Russell I hope uh, The Rock would find his own character to add to this Big Trouble Little China remake. Uh, as far as, uh, uh, you know, in, in today's technology, it's almost like they can grab my shooting the alleyway, you know, uh, TGI or something, and then just bring people back, right? <laughs> A CGI Gerald. I've kind of done my stunts and stuff, you know. You know, like in most of the interviews that I have, they ask, you know, what what are you looking for at this stage of my career? And my my punchline to all of that is that, you know, I've done other stunts and uh, I'm really looking for a romantic lead part. How's that? You better be careful because I'm a writer. I'll I'll write you a romantic lead. Watch out. (laughs) <laughs> uh, but that's that's most of my interviews when they ask me, you know, what's next kind of deal, and I say, well, my stunt days are over, uh, so I'm kind of looking for a romantic lead. <laughs> um, a couple last stunt-related martial arts questions, and then and then we'll 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 sort of be done. Um, 
who's the the toughest guy or some of the toughest guys that you've ever met in your in your run? You know, that's a real difficult question as well. I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, tough could be what does he look like and that kind of deal. You know, uh, when you see a tough guy, right off the bat, I'm looking at El Leon. Okay, my buddy on Big Trouble Little China. Yeah. Another Wing Kong hatchet man, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, I because both of us are on the bad side, we never fought each other. Um, but when you're looking at tough guys, I figure Al Leong should be way up there. Now, on the other side of the coin, there's also uh, Gene LaBelle. Uh-huh. Uh, I consider I consider a really tough guy. You know, Gene LaBelle, he's judo champ. He's done a movie, stuntman. But he would be another one. Um, so it, it's a kind of tough question. Uh, but you, I think you handled uh, it well. That was, you know, those are two great names to throw uh, in there. Yeah. Um, but I, I put Al Young, I put Al Young right up on the top. We never fought each other, but he's right up there as a tough guy, man. <laughs> Um, my, my seven year old nephew is, uh, is currently, uh, learning judo. Um, do you have any advice for kids growing up in the martial arts? Well, I grew up, I had judo as my first martial art. And I think it's a tremendous help because of the competitiveness to it. Uh, it's not so much, I would say, like a martial art, more of a sport. Uh-huh. They have that uh, cup that feeling, learn how to uh, tumble, they learn how to fall. They're not afraid to it. Because I've seen a lot of martial arts people that I, I've taught. As soon as I get them off the ground, one inch off the ground, and the butt, they freeze. So I think uh, starting out seven years old, that's excellent to me for him to start in judo. And let him get as much as he wants out of it. Because when you start talking about uh, karate, kung fu, uh, I feel that maybe you should have a little bit more mature mind to know exactly what the potential of the arts are. You know. So yeah, I I, I would say judo would be nice. I'll Very let... nice to start out with. Awesome. Um, one last question and then I'll wrap it up. How have you, have you had any formal acting training in your career? Have you gone to any improv classes or anything? Well, has that been no, in- I, interesting for you? Yeah. <laughs> it's sad to say, but I, I haven't had, in fact, uh, right after I did, uh, Killer Elite, uh, I tried to look for a manager and one of the first questions out of the, the agency was that if I was prepared to go to acting school. And because acting was kind of like a sideline, because I worked for an aerospace company for 44 years. Oh, wow. Uh, and so most of the stuff is kind of like gut feeling as I get on the stage or read a script. I kind of play it out the way I feel it should be done. So yeah, it's, it's sad that I don't have any theatrical training. Hold on, I'm like so lost right now. You worked for an aerospace company for 44 years? Yeah, I started out with wow. Douglas Aircraft Company. Then when McDonnell Douglas bought them out, I worked for them, and then I went and moved from Santa Monica in California to uh, Huntington Beach, California. And toward the later part of my uh, aircraft uh, uh, worked there, uh, Boeing bought out uh, McDonnell Douglas. Uh-huh. So in all total, uh, I worked for Douglas Aircraft, McDonnell Douglas, and Boeing. Uh, and I, I had a thing there for like 44 years, almost 45. Wow. <laughs> so the acting was kind of a sideline kind of deal. That's... Primary, my primary work was with aerospace company. Wow. I was in management. Yeah. This is yeah. like finding out that Superman <laughs> worked for a newspaper company this entire time. This is amazing. There you go. 
Uh, thank you so much, Gerald. Everyone, check out GeraldOkamura.com. Join the fan club. I did. It's awesome. I got some sweet stickers. I got a new keychain. I got an awesome autographed picture. Follow Gerald Okamura on Twitter, uh, as well as this podcast, BTILC Podcast. And uh, check out Gerald Okamura on Facebook, and also this podcast is on Facebook, simply BTILC. So thank you, Gerald. It's been a pleasure. You people, sit tight. You're more than welcome. You're more than welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. You people, sit tight, hold the fort, and keep the home fires burning. And if we're not back by dawn, call the president. Thank you, Gerald. We're all done now. Okay. Super appreciate it. I'll I'll send you a link when when this is up, but it should be up by by Monday, I imagine. Oh, super, super. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you so much. You thank you, thank you. You're the best. And if there's anything right. I can do to help in the future, promoting Dragon Fest, anything, just let me know and I'm at your service. I got you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Oh, bye. Have a nice day. Ten o'clock a little bit there, huh? Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right. Good night, Joe. Thank, Thank you. All right. Bye bye. I'm not saying I've been everywhere and I've done everything, but I do know this is a pretty amazing planet we live on. And a man would have to be some kind of fool to think we're all alone in this universe. And you are not alone in this universe. You are joined by me, Stephen E., big fan of Wang Chi and Jack B. And I hope you are too, just like me. Okay, enough rhyming. Or I'll end up in the hell of rhyming next to Dr. Seuss and Shakespeare. You just heard a sensational interview with Gerald Okamura, a.k.a. the Wing Kong Golden Gunman, a man who shares the film's Drew Sturzan poster with Kurt Russell and Kim Cattrall. This is truly an epic day on the BTILC. Just a little homework for you all. This is Danielle. This is Steven. And we're here to tell you about the Voondacast, official podcast of Voondablog.com, the home of whatever. We talk comics, movies, pop culture, dogs, Miami drivers, spies, Everything and anything awesome that we love, we talk about on this podcast every Monday at 4 Eastern Time, only here on the Radioactive Underground. Radiate! Radiate.